heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, the fallout continues for Elon Musk after the billionaire endorsed an anti-Semitic post on his social media platform. We'll discuss what it means for his businesses. And we'll return to APEC as Chinese President Xi Jinping finishes his first visit to the US in six years on a high note. What does it mean for US curbs on technology to China? Plus, we'll have full market coverage ahead amid November's $2 trillion risk rally. Can it continue? Well, that's so much more ahead, particularly the markets where we're trading today. And, well, that $2 trillion market rally that we've seen throughout November is just cooling on the day, but only slightly. NASDAQ currently basically off by about a tenth of a percent, Ed. We're still trading just 11 points on the lower side as we, of course, have a big options expiry day today. So that's going to add a little bit of volatility. The VIX, though, still managing to be sub-14. We're at a 13 handle at the moment. Really people envisaging that the Federal Reserve is going to be pulling back on its rate hike focus. It could even be cutting in the second half of 2024. And all of this, as some of the economic data this week is coming a little bit softer, we're looking at the Bloomberg dollar index actually raising all of its 2023 rally so far. And we're currently off by another three tenths of a percent. What then of the world of crypto, of course? Bitcoin vis-a-vis -vis the United States dollar is actually on the lower side, despite that weakness in the US dollar. Over the course of the five trading days, we're off by just about 3%. Look, that's relatively low volatility for this very volatile asset class. We're currently at 35,971. Ed, what are you looking at on the micro? Well, right now, the micro focus is on Tesla. We're up half a percentage point on Tesla shares at the high of the session, up 1.2 percent earlier in the morning at the low of the session, down 3 percent. There has been downward pressure on Tesla stock in the last 24 hours across two sessions after Elon Musk made that post on X, the platform formerly known as Twitter, which is being interpreted as endorsing another user's anti-Semitic post. You're going to bring us some of the details, but Around the world, there has been a cascading effect and reaction from policymakers, from companies, and Tesla shareholders, specifically two of which we'll discuss in just a moment. So right now, Tesla up half a percent, but it had been down 3% for a second day earlier in the session, Cara. And Ed, there has been some Tesla investors criticizing the Elon Musk post. Of course, one that seemingly is endorsing anti-Semitic views. More advertisers, though, are also fleeing his social media platform, X. The European Commission joined IBM in announcing it will stop advertising on X after Musk agreed with a post that said the Jewish people hold a dialectical hatred of white people. Now, Musk responded by saying, you have said the actual truth. That was Thursday. Meanwhile, this Friday morning, the White House is addressing Elon Musk's comments, saying, quote, we condemn this abhorrent promotion of anti-Semitic and racist hate in the strongest terms, which runs against our core values as Americans. Joining us now from D.C., Bloomberg's Akela Gardner. Akela, uh, give us the rest of the detail on that White House response to Elon Musk and Elon Musk's post. Yeah, the White House has been pretty adamant about condemning anti-Semitism pretty much ever since the president took office. They have a national strategy to counter anti-Semitism, and this has been a major focus of the second gentleman, who is, of course, the first Jewish spouse of a vice president. And as you mentioned, this comes on top of rebukes from the European Commission, from IBM, which both announced they would be pulling advertising from the platform. But I think the best way to think about this is in a broader and much more complicated relationship between the president and Elon Musk. Elon Musk has been very critical of Biden. He says he will not support him in 2024. He was also unhappy when Tesla was not invited to an event for EV companies earlier this year. And so that's definitely something to think about here. And at the same time, the government also has contracts with SpaceX. It also applauded Elon Musk's decision to open up their charging infrastructure to other companies. But I do think it was the timing of these comments, of course, amid the Israel-Hamas war that ultimately caused the White House to put out these statements because there has been such an increase in incidents, particularly against the Jewish community. They felt as though this was the time to make such a condemnation. 
And Kayla Gardner, we thank you so much for that really important context coming from Washington. Let's bring you more context coming from an investor base now. Kristen Hull is founder and CEO of Near Impact Capital. It's a social impact fund. It owns about $282,000 of Tesla stock as of mid-year. It's waged pressure campaigns against the company for years, including via shareholder resolutions. You put out a response to Musk's comments saying that you're appalled by Elon Musk's recent post on X. Kristen, talk us through what you think ultimately the investor viewpoint is at the moment. Oh, this is so complicated. Thank you for having me today. This is the most complicated CEO for investors to deal with, and yet it really doesn't need to be. We all are completely appalled by his statement, and we're really calling on the board to take some action. Um, if you think about what Tesla's assets are, it's that brand, um, and it's also its people. So we really count on Tesla to be innovative, and we really need them to be able to attract, recruit, uh, hire, and retain top talent. And of course, a statement like this is going to inhibit all of those. Kristen, Elon Musk has said in the past and consistently, he is absolutely pro-free speech. And he's also said on more than one occasion, he's against anti-Semitism of any kind. That's right. Y you hold a small volume of shares. My understanding is that that is basically just a function of being a social impact investor. There will be parts of our audience that say, why is Kristen on? She holds hardly any stock. Well, so we actually held Tesla for many years in our core portfolios. We really were behind that battery play. Um, and of course, the infrastructure across many of the, the products and services that Tesla is bringing for a just and innovative transition to a sustainable economy. So that thesis was really important to us. And we did hold Tesla in our core portfolios. And yet, when it became really apparent that there was racial discrimination within the plants um, and across the firm, um, we became really cautious, and there was lots of risk for us as an investor, and we pulled out. We did retain some shares, um, a small amount of shares, as you point out, so that we could keep our responsibility as investors to engage with this firm and to call them on what, in their own code of ethics, says to do the right thing. So Elon Musk is actually in violation of his own code of ethics right now, and that's why we're calling on the board. Kristen, thank you for that explanation. I, I just think the audience wanted to understand the mechanics of how your firm is operating. The emphasis is on the absolute truth statement or post that he made. He made a follow-up post, which I'm going to bring up on the screen for our audience, uh, where he says the ADL unjustly attacks the majority of the West, despite the majority of the West supporting the Jewish people and Israel. This is because they cannot, by their own tenets, criticize the minority groups who are their primary threat. It is not right and needs to stop. What do you think Elon Musk was trying to say in that post? No, Elon Musk has been erratic. He's been volatile with his speech. We never actually know <laughs> what he's trying to do. And while he is saying he's promoting free speech, hateful speech and hate speech has no place on X. Um, and it certainly doesn't have any place coming from a major um, CEO in our nation. It's interesting that certain key founders, leaders, one who actually co-founded now Meta, has called on perhaps roles within other companies that Elon Musk holds. Of course, he's not just the leader of Tesla, but he also is the owner and CTO of X, the platform with which he's currently putting out these views. And indeed, one particular key founder saying, Linda Yaccarino, your turn to actually potentially even fire your own CTO. Linda herself has been trying to point out that X's view has always been very clear that discrimination by everyone should stop across the board. What would you want to see for Elon, whether he be CTO chair of X, whether it be CEO of Tesla, whether it be his roles at the many other companies that he has? Are you calling for him to step down? So that isn't my place to call for that. I do want to see the board stepping in um, and taking action. And whether that means, you know, taking his cell phone away, that's one possibility. Um, but what we really need to see is leadership. Um, and we want to see him not only protecting his brand, but growing it in a sustainable and inclusive way. Um, you know, again, we want to see employees 
uh, both current and future, feel not only really comfortable, but excited to join this and bring their top talent and expert and skills. And then also on the consumer side, there are so many consumers right now saying they're getting rid of their Tesla and they're certainly not considering um, purchasing anything new. And so with a prime business model um, at Tesla at any rate, um, we need to see as an investor that that CEO is really looking out for the business model and that brand has so much to do. So there's, um, I personally would like to see him step down. Whether that's possible, that's really up to the board. Kristen, it's been interesting because this hasn't happened in a vacuum. In fact, we have seen him put out very controversial posts before, some which he has indeed retracted, and he's gone on to say he's for and pro free speech, but against anti-Semitism anti in all its forms. But he's almost been a bit like Teflon. Nothing has stuck, and Tesla nevertheless is up 90% year to date in terms of a share price, and people thus far perhaps haven't been pulling back on their Tesla purchases. It's been deemed more of a consumer weakness story than it has actually a pushback against Elon Musk. Can you really sort of drive that narrative together? Do you think this is the moment that we see a tipping point? You know, it's going to be interesting to see what we what we see as a tipping point, because with a regular company, an ordinary company without one of the richest um, billionaire CEOs, um, we would have seen other consequences much earlier. Um, Elon Musk is an icon in the U.S. and across the world, and he seems to be treated differently, both by his board and by his um, fan base. And that's problematic. I believe, for the kind of companies and the kind of corporations that we want to see grow in the U.S. We reiterate that Tesla has rebounded to positive territory, having been down as much as 3% in the session over a two-day basis. Of course, it's lower, but on the week, I think, on track for a pretty sizable gain. There are many that took to X in support of Elon Musk, who are both Tesla shareholders and vehicle owners. But there's one name that seems aligned with you, and that is Ross Gerber, a Tesla investor who says his clients, he's an asset manager, his clients are asking him to unwind their positions. They will no longer buy Tesla cars. My understanding is that you are doing a new initiative where you'll write to the board of Tesla in the coming week. Have you spoken to Ross and who are you trying to bring in on the initiative that you're taking? Actually, that's really interesting. So we we haven't spoken to Ross yet. I welcome that. I maybe he's available for a phone call this afternoon. That would be great. Um, we are part of a coalition with Whistle Stop Capital and many others who have written to the board, and we did that actually earlier this year. We put out um, a statement and a letter um, speaking about lots of different issues that we want to see the board take up. And sadly, we have not had a response. And so we've been meeting as a group uh, monthly to figure out how we can be engaged to really support this company to be its best. Um, and we will resend that letter with a new cover letter with the additional grievances that have occurred since we sent the original letter, and that should go out in the next couple of weeks. Kristen Hull, let us know what the response, if any, is. And we thank you so much for articulating your point of view for NIA Impact Capital today. We thank you for your time. Meanwhile, coming up, look, we're going to turn to the markets because, well, as we've been saying, Tesla stock is up over the last five days and indeed over the last month. Tech stocks have really outperformed and we're up $2 trillion worth in terms of a risk rally in November. But could it be at a slowing point? Ed, what are you looking at? I'm looking at shares of Applied Materials, the biggest US maker of chip making equipment. You see there the stock down 5.5%, 5 5.4%. .5 Reuters reporting that a probe's been opened by the US into it breaching those US technology cur export curbs to China. We'll get the details next. This is Bloomberg Technology. Technology stocks wavering today amid November's $2 trillion rally. What can we expect going forward? There's a bit of earnings still to come. And joining us now, Jonathan Curtis, Franklin Equity Group Senior VP and Director of Portfolio Management. You're an investor who holds a number of the, the magnificent seven key semiconductor names and software names. It's in the chip space I want to start. Um, Applied Materials, the report of that probe, looking at whether they... Uh, breach the U.S. technology export curves to China. You hold applied materials across different Franklin funds. Just to, what did you make of that report first, Jonathan? 
Yeah, well, in fact, uh, it, Applied Materials had actually disclosed back in October of 2022, I believe, that uh, they were they were under investigation. Uh, the incremental news that we got yesterday out of Reuters was that the investigation had turned uh, perhaps potentially criminal. I don't think the, comment, the company is commenting on the specifics of that report. But, you know, importantly, uh, Applied Materials is one of the world's leading semiconductor capital equipment companies. They're involved in really every part of the market with the exception of lithography. They're a leading player in, in the space. They're very, very essential for um, uh, Western fabs, fabs in Korea, fabs in Taiwan, and fabs in China. And while if they, if they have made a mistake or if somebody uh, deeper down in the company made a mistake and allowed equipment to make its way over to uh, SMIC in China, uh, then certainly that should be dealt with. But I don't think that any sanctions uh, that would be imposed would negatively impact the company's earnings power or their, certainly their moat. Uh, they're a critical supplier in the ecosystem and very, very essential to, uh, to keep operating. Jonathan, extrapolate out the China risk to, to, the, to the industry more broadly, right? If you think about how NVIDIA's traded over the last seven days, some of it's on reports of new gen China specific trip, chips, right? Trying to get product that complies with these curbs. Clearly, there is a danger of being in breach of them. How, as an investor, do you navigate that? Yeah, well, so certainly, listen, China uh, wants to be able to be a player uh, on some of these leading edge. Uh, chips. They want to be able to manufacture them. Certainly, they want to have them for their own efforts in cloud computing, in military, and in artificial intelligence. And the U.S. is trying to curb that. Um, China is a very big market. Um, even if China is not able to uh, acquire the chips they want, they will certainly find other ways around being able to get the mo get the most leading edge chips by manu manufacturing their own less powerful chips, but spending then more money on the equipment to, to build those less powerful chips and more money on the infrastructure to run those chips so they can match the compute capacity uh, in the West. So we, we th in an odd way, we actually think it is positive for the industry because it ultimately means that uh, th there's an overspend, if, if you will, happening in China to support matching the compute capacity requirements uh, of China. So. Um, but certainly, we are paying close attention to it. You know, we brought up applied materials at the beginning of our conversation. Um, I think 44% of their revenue in the most recent quarter was from, in fact, China. Um, so certainly, China is a big consumer. The U.S. is really trying to limit China's access to uh, equipment and processes and chips at the leading edge. Um, but China can make uh, good progress and build a very successful industry on lagging edge uh, nodes uh, if, if they want it. And they'll just end up having to overspend uh, to match the compute capacity available in the West for more advanced chips. Jonathan, it's interesting. Ed mentions NVIDIA, of course, and the way in which they're trying to build different types of chips to meet the current standards. NVIDIA, of course, got its earnings coming up fast. And I'm interested in your perspective on ultimately how far these Magnificent Seven have room yet to run. There is an idea, I think it was put out by Goldman Sachs, that 2024, you stay, you hold, you remain invested. And actually, these Magnificent Seven are still going to be some of the companies that deliver into the next year as well. Do you abide by that with the valuations? Yeah. Yeah, we're certainly uh, quite positive on really the entire uh, technology sector and artificial intelligence in particular. The Magnificent Seven have done well because they are truly magnificent businesses, strong balance sheets, high levels of profitability, structural growers. But almost all of them, with the exception of one or two, have very strong AI talk tracks and opportunities. They have massive amounts of data. They can get more data. They can wrangle the compute to build these models. They have the talent to build these models. And then they have the pathways into which to, live, to deliver value from these models into their customers and charge for them. Some of these companies have the potential to double their overall businesses on the delivery of AI features into just a small number of their of their, their businesses. Yeah. So there is great potential that lies ahead for many of the Magnificent Seven. Now, we own many of them. Um, we happen to be underweight them. We see greater value down the market cap range, companies that have some of those same characteristics as the Magnificent Seven, but that are trading at more compelling uh, valuation levels. Can you just very quickly tell us some of the names, therefore, that are less obvious? Sure. Uh, a company like a ServiceNow, for instance, 
they have, they can tick all those boxes that the Magnificent Seven can in terms of being able to be a player in AI. But I think they're just a less well understood business. Mm. They have significant opportunities to raise prices and to deliver new value to their customers to make their customers more efficient, all with generative AI. Jonathan Curtis, we thank you of Franklin Equity Group. Great to have you with your overall market viewpoint. Meanwhile, coming up, global collaboration on AI. We talk about another magnificent company well, in, within the Magnificent Seven Alphabet CEO. Sundar Pichai has been preaching at the Apex Summit in San Francisco. We'll hear more of his thoughts. That's next. That's Bloomberg Technology. Time now for Talking Tech. First up, Apple may be falling behind, in fact, on its efforts to make a modem chip for the iPhone. Apple will likely miss rolling out its own a modem for 2025 due to the complex designs of Qualcomm's chip. Meanwhile, OpenAI's Sam Altman believes we have yet to see the biggest risks that AI poses to U.S. politics and policy. While he's hopeful that artificial intelligence can help humanity in the longer term, Altman has called for government oversight of the technology in the near term. Plus, Amazon cutting hundreds of jobs in its voice-activated Alexa division. Now, the company says it's shifting efforts to better focus on building capabilities powered by, you guessed it, generative AI. Ed. Back here in SF, Sundar Pichai says he expects China to be at the forefront of AI. The Alphabet CEO called China's work on the technology astounding to see during a conversation over at APEC. Have a listen. It's not going to be easy, but, uh, but I would start from this premise that AI will proliferate. So this is not the inherent nature of software. AI advances will get out to you know, all countries. And so it is naturally the kind of technology, I don't think there's any unilateral safety to be had. We all have a shared incentive to solve for safety. You know, you could have AI go wrong in one country that will impact every other country. So in some ways, it's like climate change in the planet. We all share a planet. I think that's true for AI. So now that you know that that will be true, I think you have to start building the frameworks globally to make progress. I've seen encouraging progress uh, when the G7 happened in Hiroshima. I think it was a good start. You've seen more progress. The UK AI Summit last week, the administration here, the White House has been uh, leading the way as well. And I saw good encouraging announcements even yesterday for US and China to start having a dialogue on AI. Alphabet CEO Suno Pichai there. Meanwhile, coming up, we're going to talk more about US and China relationship, but the tensions that are there when it comes to technology. President Xi wrapping up his trip to the United States. From New York, from San Francisco, where APEC has been held, this is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. Ed Ludlow here in San Francisco. And Caroline Hyde in New York, getting you a quick check on these markets halfway through this trading day as we end the week, as we, of course, await that big options expiry, which could add a little bit of volatility as we threw out the trading day. We're off by about two-tenths of a percent on the Nasdaq 100, but remember how far, how fast we have come. In the month of November, we've added more than $2 trillion to market capitalizations on the Nasdaq and, indeed, on the S&P 500. Goldman Sachs saying stay invested. We're going to see more growth, about 5% for the year of 2024. Meanwhile, Bank of America starting to say fade it. I'm looking at what's happening in the bond market and look, we're just fading ever so slightly, basically flat on the day when it comes to your yields as we still analyze where the Federal Reserve goes in terms of its policy and some of the weakening macro data. We've seen Bitcoin actually now turning around. We're up about 1.1% on the day, but we're down <coughs> and on the last five trading days even with some dollar weakness. Let's have a look at what's happening on the individual movers that I'm looking at, because Microsoft is actually your worst to the points perspective on the Nasdaq, and we're off by more than 1%. Maybe this is a little bit of profit-taking on what has been an exceptional run, one of the magnificent seven that everyone's been talking about. Apply materials, idiosyncratic news here coming, of course, reports of an, a criminal investigation coming from the United States as to whether or not they did perhaps bypass some of those restrictions on exports to China. We're down by 5.3%, reporting coming from Reuters. Tesla actually in the green 
clean up four tenths of a percent. Again, idiosyncratic news. We're trying to make maybe it's not a causal link, but there has, of course, been some weakness in Tesla's trading yesterday after, of course, what has been seemingly an endorsement for some anti-Semitic posts put on X by the owner of X and indeed the CEO of Tesla, which is Elon Musk. But a lot to still be dissecting across the board, Ed. Yeah, that was the big story of the last 24 hours. The other is APEC, which is wrapping up in San Francisco. It's a who's who of global power players in politics and technology. One of them, I'm delighted to say, joins me right now on set, Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Horden. You make it to that party last night down the road? I did not, no. Okay, I'm too well, tired. <laughs> I'm, in all seriousness, everyone that matters in the world has been here. When you last joined us on the show, it was all about Biden G. What happened after that, particularly in the world of technology as well? Yeah, I think Biden and Xi really was the starting gun to this entire APEC summit. But then for Xi Jinping, as much as in the Biden meeting was very important, actually the New York Times had a story about one of the organizers was talking about how the Chinese had prepared three speeches for him to give those executives. And he ended up going with the friendliest one after the Biden meeting. That room where he got all those applauses, it cost a lot of money. to Talking about Tim Cook being in the room as Tim well, Cook people being in the like room, that. Larry Fang, Steve Schwartzman. But then we also had a letter from Xi Jinping going out to executives saying he wants a heartwarming uh, welcome, really, of the business community. He's clearly trying to woo investors. And it comes as there's been a tumble, really, a foreign direct investment into China. So this was Xi Jinping's opening in his moment. The problem is these are just words at this moment. They sound very fuzzy and warm from the Chinese president. But will there be actions? I will note. About a few hours before Xi Jinping's letter became public and his remarks to these executives, the Chinese Commerce Ministry did say that they are going to try to go after a campaign for potential discriminative measures that are happening to foreign investors. So, AKA technology export curbs. Uh, talk, technology export curbs. I'm talking more about foreign direct investment into China. But yes, technology companies have been having a, lot, a number of issues in China. But if we are talking about technology export curbs from the United States into China, that is something that I'm sure Xi Jinping brought up with President Biden. But the U.S. is not going to budge on any of these sanctions, any of these penalties that potentially can hinder their national security. Anne-Marie Horden, it's been great to have you on the show throughout the week. We really appreciate it. And we want to well, pick up where Anne-Marie leaves off. Ultimately, has these discussions in any way changed the ultimate relationship, the trade relationship between U.S. and China thus far? We've got the perfect guest, Liza Tobin, Senior Director of Research Analysis for the Economy over at Special Competitive Studies Project. And indeed, you previously served on the National Security Council staff as China Director, where you helped lead development of multiple U.S. strategies and policies related to China. And, and to that end point, like, will policy change? Will doing business get any easier between these two nations? Thank you so much. No, I think the previous speaker is right. I think the, the, the talk out of Xi Jinping is trying to signal that China is open to business, but I think words are cheap. And I think what we're seeing is a tactical shift, but no strategic shift on either side. I think the U.S. is going to keep up the pressure on the technology and economic controls. And for China's side, I don't think Xi Jinping's strategy has um, changed at all uh, over the long term. I think this is trying to kind of reduce some of the pressure given how weak China's economy is looking lately. OK, so paint us forward five, ten years time. What does this relationship look like? What does this self ability to provide for chips, for manufacturing, for technological innovation within China look like? Can they be self have self-determination in that respect? The administration going into this was really signaling that they see the United States as in a long-term strategic rivalry and competition with the People's Republic of China. And so this meeting was intended to kind of set a floor and stabilize relations. And they kind of signaled very low expectations that they hope to, at the very least, restore some kind of military to military communications. So going forward, uh, based on the updates last month that you saw to the export controls on the high-end AI chips, these were really a doubling down by the U.S. administration on those controls and a signaling that they realize that they're in a cat and mouse game and that China will adjust to the U.S. controls and continue to seek loopholes. But the administration in response will continue to update them in order to try to meet the objective of preventing China from using U.S. Uh, high-end ships to um, accelerate their military development. 
Liza, you said a moment ago, uh, words are cheap. I think that's what you said. But we're talking largely in the context of the diplomatic relationship between the US and China. You look at who was in the room Wednesday night, Tim Cook, Hock Tan of Broadcom. It seems as if the private sector, the biggest technology companies in the world, have a very different attitude to China. They just want to do business there. Beijing is smart. It has a strategy of trying to exploit the gaps and uh, the splits in American society, you know, federal government versus uh, local and state level government, public and private. They realize that we're a democracy and they try to exploit these gaps. However, I think uh, given how increasingly opaque and hostile to foreign businesses the Chinese market is, I don't think you're going to see any kind of strategic rapprochement between the companies. China has moved on beyond the era of reform and opening. That, that era is over. They still say these words, but I think the reality on the ground is becoming increasingly hostile. Liza, it's Friday. It's been a long week. <laughs> what is the most positive outcome from APEC? What is a good thing that's come out of it? Look, there's the. I had mentioned that the administration kind of set a low bar for itself, and I think they stepped over those low expectations easily. And there are a few kind of concrete deliverables. One that uh, they're quite, I think, gratified by is an agreement to work with the Chinese on counter -nar narcotics. And of course, there's a lot of precursor chemicals for fentanyl flowing into the United States, much of it coming through Mexico. And they're signaling that the Chinese are starting to take some actions to crack down on firms that are doing this. And so I think the hope is very modest that at least in the short term, we can save some American lives by limiting the flow of this. So we should expect the cooperation on the Chinese side to turn on and off, depending on how happy they are with other aspects of the relationship. But in the short term, if we can save American lives, I think that's a good thing. Um, it's also good for our militaries to be talking to each other. That's a pretty low bar, but it, uh, we need to be communicating to avoid some kind of misunderstanding. And then they've also announced that we will start some type of initial discussions with the Chinese about AI risk and safety. And of course, this is something the U.S. is talking to a lot of different partners and allies around the world about, about and, and they'll, they'll start doing the same with China. All right, Liza Tobin of the Special Competitive Studies Project, thank you for joining us here on Bloomberg Technology. Now, coming up on the show, we'll be joined by Michelle Gonzalez, head of Microsoft's venture arm, to discuss her outlook for venture capital. An interesting strategy there, private markets and a big tech name. That's next. This is Bloomberg Technology. Time for the VC Roundup. And in the news, Canadian startup Deep Sky raised $55 million from VC firms and governments to begin a carbon capture plant in Quebec. It uses early stage technology aiming to suck millions of tons of emissions out of the atmosphere and also out of the oceans. And over in Japan, Japan's state-backed foundry startup Rapidus says it will work to develop semiconductor technology with Canada's Tenstorrent. The companies will exchange know-how on two nanometer logic chips to help devices access AI, according to Rapidus. Plus, billionaires Xavier Neal, Rodolphe Saad and Eric Schmidt announced a new non-profit AI research lab in Paris. The lab will have 300 million euros in total funding and produce open source research. Caroline. We've got to stick with the world of AI, labs and investment. It's today's VC Spotlight. Let's bring in Michelle Gonzalez. She is corporate vice president, global head of Microsoft's venture fund, M12. And what's so fascinating is you are aligning with your own thesis-driven view on investing, but also basically what works alongside Microsoft's own business focus and in many ways helps turbocharge some of the companies that you have in your portfolio. Where is anything being done outside of AI? I mean, it's everything about artificial intelligence for you right now. Well, thank you, Carolyn, for having me here. Yes, we view AI as a revolution on the order of mobile, uh, the smartphone technology, cloud computing, the internet itself. We've even had a few of our experts in-house think of it as the impact uh, on you know society uh, 
similar to electricity. Hmm. And so we are all in on AI as M12's invest, uh, investment arm. We are Microsoft's venture fund, uh, a CVC uh, thesis driven. So the other areas that we do cover are cybersecurity. Uh, we have the GitHub fund, which is focused on developer tools. Uh, and oh, look, there's our uh, our portfolio <laughs> companies. Um, we have uh, we invest in infrastructure, deep tech, as well as enterprise applications. Now, it's quite an expensive place to be investing right now for AI, amazingly, considering the macro economy. And it's also pretty competitive. What is your edge? I mean, in lots of ways, we started to see big corporates come in because they can offer basically the compute power. Is that something that really has set you apart? Yeah, this is actually a golden age for corporate venture capital, particularly with Gen AI. Founders are looking for uh, access to customers. Um, so in the enterprise right now, there's a lot of excitement. Um, so we're seeing about 60% of enterprises say they want to adopt AI technology and then needing to have sort of the right partners. So that's one aspect for us. We also, as you mentioned, have access to technology. So we just announced a AI supercomputer dedicated GPUs for M12 portfolio companies. And you see this um, as well with NVIDIA and Salesforce's uh, uh, investments as well. So for us, we look to connections, customer access, helping these companies get go-to-market ready, selling to the enterprise, uh, as well as the compute. I want to dig in on that supercomputer. It's interesting. Access to compute is something we talk about on the show all the time. It's great having the, the, the supercomputer be built in the first place. Who pays for it on an ongoing basis so that your portfolio companies and founders can have access to that compute? Well, what I can tell you um, now, right now we're offering this uh, as a way for our com uh, companies to start experimenting with their training. Uh, and it is free uh, for a certain time, but we are a business, so uh, eventually there'll be uh, a pay uh, for that as well. Michelle, real quick, give us an example of something that you've invested in that down the road has ended up becoming a part of Microsoft mm. or the technology that Microsoft uses. Yeah, so um, one actually recent example here is InWorld. We invested two years ago. Uh, I knew the founders from uh, Google, uh, and this is a company that's focused on non-player characters, um, so AI uh, characters in the gaming space. And we just announced a multi-year co-development partnership with Microsoft. This is about a year in the making, and our team worked very hard uh, to ensure uh, that this partnership came together. This will now allow game developers on Xbox to have access to almost an AI gaming co-pilot, which will help them uh, with prompting for different scripts and help building their uh, game development. So that's one example, but we have uh, several others. And uh, <clears throat> Well, Corporate Vice President and Global Head of Enter, Michelle Gonzalez, when one of those examples goes big, come back on the show. Tell us about yeah, it. Thank definitely. you so much for your time. <laughs> thank you so All right, much. Come in. Thank you for joining us. So coming up here on Bloomberg Technology, Look, as more advertisers excuse me, are leaving X, it's a mid-backlash against Elon Musk. We're going to discuss what this all means for the future of that social media platform. There's the in the moment, and then there's the bigger picture of what's happening at X, and we will discuss that next. This is Bloomberg Technology. The fallout from an Elon Musk post seemingly endorsing anti-Semitic views, it continues to spread, whether it's Tesla investors criticizing the billionaire or more advertisers continuing to flee his social media platform X, including, for example, IBM. Let's bring in Bloomberg Business Week columnist Max Chafkin, who has been following the rise, the volatility around Elon Musk for years now. Ultimately, this has sort of been hiding in plain sight for a long time. Does this time it stick? Yeah, you know, Elon Musk, as you said, has kind of had an edgy social media pl presence for years. As anyone who followed the, you know, uh, funding secured uh, brouhaha five years ago n knows, you know, he's always sort of done things that are a little bit outside of the norm. 
this is something further. This was a an explicit endorsement of a anti-Semitic conspiracy theory, and in fact, an anti-Semitic conspiracy th theory that has been cited in you know a prominent mass shooting. It's the same philosophy that was used uh, by the mass shooter uh, in the Tree of Life synagogue who killed 11 people. Um, so certainly uh, very serious. Um, we've seen responses from investors. We've seen a handful of advertisers. Um, you know, a lot lot of sort of uh, backlash to this. And Elon Musk, I think, crucially, has not really responded. I mean, he sort of attempted to do a little damage control the night of, but mostly he's been tweeting through it and more or less standing by what he said. Well, more than that, we've written to everyone and chased every avenue we have to try and get an answer or a response from Elon Musk for what it's worth. There's two things happening in parallel. So Media Matters posts this report on Thursday, right? And it shows that names like Apple, Oracle, IBM, their ads are showing up in timelines alongside sensitive content. For example, posts that are pro-Nazi, as an example. And X wrote to me this morning, uh, Max, we're showing their response right now. But they're basically saying this is a function of the, the Media Matters uh, researchers, their user base. In other words, this is how ad targeting works. And therein lies a bigger technology problem about the health of that platform, right? Yeah, we, we should also say that, you know, Linda Yaccarino uh, posted essentially sort of like halfway towards a subtweet of Elon Musk saying they, that, that the company doesn't tolerate anti-Semitism of any kind. Um, I do think uh, it's a lot harder to make the argument that you're taking hate speech seriously when the if the de facto leader of the company, you know, Linda Yaccarino is the CEO, but, but Musk uh, is, is the owner and seems to be making all the big decisions, is going out there and act actively tweeting hate speech himself, right? It's harder to say you're taking this seriously, and that's going to create a huge uh, pr challenge with advertisers. Dustin Moskowitz, for example, he was one of the co-founders of Facebook. He sort of put it out there in a social media post saying, look, Linda actually needs to fire Elon Musk as CTO, as chair, whether or not that's in any way feasibly possible. But at what point do you think, if ever, this might have ramifications on his holding of senior executive titles across his incredibly successful businesses? Well, I think each of his companies are going to be a little bit different. You know, Tesla, of course, is a publicly traded company with a huge customer base. Now, that customer base has traditionally been left of center, right? These are environmentalists, and, and you got to think that this is going to have an impact on Tesla's already significant challenges generating demand, demand for its cars. SpaceX is a government contractor. So you, you ask, like, is the Biden administration, are they, are they going um, to... They've already put, a, they've they've, already put, they've put out a statement. You know, it, uh, I suppose it's possible to go further. Um, I, I do think at some point we will see a response from us because the volume is, is, is getting up there. But, uh, but it's, it's telling, I'd say, that it hasn't happened yet. All right, Bloomberg's Max Trafkin, that has been the top story of the last 24 hours. It is not the only story in the world of Elon. SpaceX has a significant launch planned for Saturday. Starship will do a full attempt, number two, joining us, Bloomberg's Lauren Grush. And Lauren, what is significant about this attempt and what are we expecting to happen? Sure. So as you mentioned, it's the second time ever that SpaceX will be launching a fully stacked Starship system. So that's the Starship spacecraft on top of its massive super heavy booster. And, you know, I can't tell you what we expect. Last time when it launched, Elon mentioned, you know, excitement would be guaranteed. Preferably, we're looking to see them do quite a bit better than last time. If you watch the last, the first launch attempt, uh, they did, uh, you know, have a few engine failures, and then the rocket started spinning out of control, and SpaceX was forced to intentionally yes. destroy it. So the goal, hopefully, is to get a little farther than last time. Uh, Lauren, just outline the rocket science from from countdown ten nine eight seven six five four three two one zero liftoff. What happens thereafter? Sure. So at liftoff, presumably all 33 Raptor engines at the base of Super Heavy will ignite, lifting off the entire rocket. 
Roughly two and a half minutes into flight, we're going to be looking at this thing called stage separation. So that's Super Heavy and Starship separating. And something that SpaceX will be testing on this flight is known as hot staging. So the engines on the Starship spacecraft will ignite briefly while that Super Heavy booster is still attached, giving it a bit of a kick and pushing it away. That's something that SpaceX changed from the first launch, and it's the only thing they can only test it during flight. So that's going to be something exciting to watch. And then yeah. if all goes well, hopefully Starship will continue on reaching near orbit and doing almost a full lap around the Earth before it comes down off the coast of Hawaii. Right. Lauren right. Grash, we thank you so much. That does it for the decision, this edition of Bloomberg Technology, Ed. Yep, recap the podcast wherever we get yours. This is Bloomberg.